Over the last six weeks, we have taken a look at six out of the seven churches that Jesus had a message for in the second and in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. Here in our study this week, we take a look at the seventh church. We take a look at the church of the Laodiceans, known as the lukewarm church, the church that I say, the church that did not care. It was an apathetic church. All the churches, the messages that we have seen from Jesus to the six churches that we have studied so far, I have said to all of you that those messages, that they should resonate with the church, the collective church today. That is, again, a message that should resonate with all of us true and sincere, faithful believers in Christ. The message that we take a look at here this week to the lukewarm church it is a message that I believe all of us, all of us certainly need to receive as a collective church today. I feel like the church that was in Sardis is very representative of today's church so far as moving out of religion rather than moving out of sincere faith. And we'll see a message this week that I believe certainly resonates with the period that we are living in today when it comes to the age of the church. I believe that that when I was younger growing up, the church was a lot different than what the church is like today. There was a fire within the church when I was growing up that is just not, and this is again in my opinion, and I believe that some of you will agree with this as well. There's a fire that is just not burning within today's church. As I said in that, that study uh, with the, the church of Sardis, the church has gotten a lot older and a lot of those older believers, many of them have passed away. And we are seeing a time period where generations like my generation, we should have already stepped up in the church, but generations like my generation, Gen X as well, I'm not gonna exclude y'all from this, we aren't present in the church. We aren't active in the church today. And so the local church is slowly starting to fade away. And so we are left with a church today that is going to be very similar to what we'll study here in our scripture for today. Our scripture for today that we're going to be focusing in on comes from the third chapter of the book of Revelation. We are going to take a look at the 14th through the 22nd verse. That's going to be the scripture of our focus for today. The key verses that I am going to focus in on today will be the 15th, both the 15th and the 16th verse. I'm going to focus a great deal on those two verses as again, those verses will cover essentially a rebuke from Jesus. And again, like I said, it is a rebuke that I believe speaks loudly in our world for today. So we're again taking a look at the lukewarm church, the church of the Laodiceans. My sub thought for today is what it is that God wants us to do. That is the Lord wants us to wake up. So this is a wake up message for today's church. We'll see there in the 14th verse. Scripture says, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, write, Jesus is saying to John, write these things to the messenger of the church of the Laodiceans. That is the pastor of the Laodiceans, the bishop of the church of the Laodiceans. The message that the greeting, I should say, that Jesus says there, we'll see, says these things, says the amen, the faithful and the true witness the beginning of the creation of God. Let's take a look at this greeting here again. And he says that he is the amen. What do you all think about that? What do you think? What do you think it means that he is the amen? Well, what does that, what does that word mean? We say it all the time, right? What, what does amen mean? What do you think that means to you? Well, typically when we say amen, we say amen at the conclusion of our prayers, right? At least I, I certainly know that I do. And again, who, who, all the times I've heard anyone pray, they typically say amen at the closing of their prayer. But do you know why you say that at the closing of your prayer? Do you know what you're saying? When I stand up and, and when I preach, you, you may hear it. It may come through the microphone when, when I'm preaching where I get a few amens 
And, and that's typically said when someone is standing in agreement with something that I have said in the sermon. They say, amen, which they essentially, they're saying, hey, I agree with that. That is true. And that's essentially what amen means. You know, let something be done. Let it be true. We say that at the end of our prayers to essentially say, let it be done, Lord. Let this be done. And, and again, yes, we end our prayers on that note. Let it be done. Let this be true. Let this be final, if you will. And so that's that's essentially what amen means. And when Jesus says there that he is the amen, you can kind of think of this as Jesus again saying that he is the way, the truth and the light. Again, that scripture that is very familiar to us from the 14th chapter of John's gospel and the sixth verse. When Jesus says that he is the amen, it reminds us of what Jesus says at the closing chapter in the closing chapter of the book of Revelation, where Jesus says that he is the alpha and the omega. When we look at the 22nd chapter of the book of Revelation and we take a look at that 13th verse, Jesus, he said, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the Omega. He said the beginning and the end. He said that he is the first and the last. I have had discussions with people that that Jesus, that he was the end of the law, meaning that he was the conclusion of the law. The law needed Jesus because, again, the law, it could point out sins. It could point out someone's sin. But there was no offer of salvation. Jesus is the salvation. Again, like you said, he is the way, the truth and the life. So he says here to the church of the Laodiceans that he is the amen, that he is he is the truth, that he is uh, final. We'll see there that he also said there in the 14th verse that he is the faithful and true witness. He said that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Him being the faithful and the true witness, it speaks of Jesus again in a manner that he came from heaven to share the word of God with us. And in the word that he shared with us, what did he share? Well, he shared the divine truth. Jesus said that that he is the light of the world. And as the light of the world, he revealed the divine truth to us. What is that divine truth? Well, the divine truth is that we are sinners. The divine truth is that that we live in sin, that we dwell in sin. And because of that, we fall short of the glory of the Lord. And because we fall short of the glory of God, we need assistance. We need help so that we no longer fall short. We need help getting across the finish line. And Jesus said that he is that help. He said that we need to turn away from our sin. He called on us to repent. And he called on us to move in that repentance. Moving in that repentance would be us being obedient to the word of God, heeding Jesus's instructions. And those instructions are to love the Lord with our whole heart. And in that love, we are to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. We are to commit ourselves to the way of Christ. We are to lean on him. We are to depend on him. We are to trust in him. We are to serve him, the Lord and him alone, nothing and nobody else. Jesus, he came to us as a witness of the kingdom of heaven. And again, he told us that in his father's house, there are many mansions and that he is going away to prepare a place for us. Again, he said that in the 14th chapter of John's gospel. And again, in the 14th chapter of John's gospel, Jesus said that he is coming again to receive us unto himself. Again, he is the true and faithful witness of the Lord. He came to the world and he said that he came to do not his will, but to do the will of the father. And as he said and shown to us in scripture, he said that everything that he heard from the father, that is what he has shared. That is what he has testified to all of us. And again, there in that 14th verse, in this greeting here, where he says that he is the beginning of the creation of God. Let us not take that to mean that, that Jesus was created by God. 
Jesus is God. Let us remember, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That is what John wrote in the first chapter of John, the first verse. And we'll see in the first chapter of John that, that the Word, it became flesh and it dwelt among us, mankind. That again is Jesus. He wasn't created by the Lord. Jesus is God. God was made the word. The word became flesh. Jesus is the only begotten son of God. So when we talk about him being the beginning of the creation of God, as we see there in the 14th verse, let us understand that Jesus was there in the beginning. Again, he is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and then. Let us not think there that Jesus was saying that he was literally created by God. No, he was there during the creation, creating, setting all things that we know that we are able to physically see, setting all of that into motion for us. Now, let's dive into our key verses for today. We've seen that greeting, that greeting. That's a greeting there. Again, Jesus Essentially in that greeting was letting it be known that he is the sovereign one, the one who has all authority. Again, nobody comes to the father, but by him, he is the first and he is the last. We'll see there in the 15th verse where Jesus, he says there, he says, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. Jesus says there, let's take the 16th verse as well there says there in the 16th verse, it says, so then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Let's stop right there. Again, Jesus said, I know your works. So what do you think it says about this church that Jesus, when speaking about the works of this church, He said that it was neither cold nor hot. The only way that he could describe this church was it being lukewarm. What what do you think that says about this church? Now, and again, all the other studies that we have studied so far in this series, the six other churches, when, when Jesus, when he commended those churches, he would always say, I know your works. And he will be able to, to, to speak about their works in both a good way. And then he will be able to rebuke the church. The only churches that Jesus did not rebuke was the church of Philadelphia, which we studied about last week. And then the church in Smyrna, the church that faced tribulation and it was enduring by faith. It was, was overcoming. Those were the only two churches that Jesus, he had nothing but good, to say about those churches and and he just continued to encourage them uh, to be faithful. Now the other four churches, Jesus, he could say good things about those churches. That includes the dead church, the church in Sardis, that includes the the corrupt church, the church that was in Thyatira, and that includes the, the compromising church, the church that was in Pergamos. We was looking at those churches and and You know, we was uh, we was thinking to ourselves, this isn't good. This isn't good. This isn't good. But let us remember that Jesus had good things that he could complement those churches on. For example, if we turn back over to the second chapter of the book of Revelation and we look at the the church that was in Pergamos, for example, there we'll see where Jesus, he said there in the 13th verse that he knew their works. He knew that they dwelt where Satan's throne was. But look at the compliment that he had for that church, the good that he had to say about uh, this church that was taking the steps in compromising in their faith. But he said that, hey, there were some there who held fast to his name and did not deny their faith, even in the days in which Antipas, his faithful servant, was martyred. There was something good that he could say to those who were of that church, the church in Pergamos. When we think about the corrupt church, the the church in Thyatira, we'll look there again in the second chapter of the book of Revelation. We'll see there in the 19th verse where Jesus, he said to the church in Thyatira again, I know your works. He knew their love, their service, their faith, their patience. And then he said, as for your works, 
the last are more than the first. This is what he said to the church where many in that church were, were being corrupted by the Jezebel of that church. But there were some who were present in that church that still had works, works that was not dying off, works that was actually growing. They were more than when they first began. He had good to say about that church. Even when we skip over again to the third chapter of the book of Revelation and we take a look at the church in Sardis, the dead church. Jesus, he could say to that church there uh, in the first verse, he could say, I know your works, that you have a name, that you are alive, but you are dead. But then again, he could say to that church, be watchful and strengthen the things which remain that are ready to die. For I have not found your works perfect. No, their works weren't perfect. Yes, they they were moving in religion, but they were trying. Right. And Jesus, he could, could say, look, you have some kind of works. All right. You have some in this church who, again, just take a look there at the third chapter of the book of Revelation in the fourth verse where Jesus said to those who are in the church in Sardis, he said, you have a few names, even in Sardis, who have not defied their garments. There were still the, some there that were present, that were still moving by faith, that those who may have been moving in religion could look to and then could follow their examples so that they could move in sincere faith. We was looking at those three churches specifically, and we was going, I don't want to be like those churches, but even though we saw that, we could still see that there was some good. And again, I don't want to leave out the church of Ephesus, the church of Ephesus that was there uh, in the beginning of the second chapter of the book of Revelation. Their real struggle was the fact that they were not moving with compassion. And again, that's something that many of us struggle with today where we let the world beat down on us so much that we begin to become a bit bitter in how we move in our faith where we should be compassionate uh, when we move in our faith. So again, in the six churches that we have studied so far, Jesus, he commended those churches. There were good things that he could commend about those churches. And then there were things that he could rebuke in those churches that that he could approve on. They at least those churches had some type of works that Jesus could commend. Now, when we turn again over to the third chapter and we look at what Jesus said there to the church of the Laodiceans, Jesus, he said there again in the 15th verse, I know your works that you are neither cold nor hot. This church had no fire. This church, it wasn't even cold. What was this church? Jesus said that this church was lukewarm. He said, I could wish you were cold or hot, but then he said, you are lukewarm. We'll see there in the 16th verse. He said, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. We're going to really touch on that vomiting, vomiting out of the mouth in a moment, but I, I really just want to focus on the lukewarm part. How does, how does a church become lukewarm? What does that even mean? What do you think of when you think of lukewarm? For example, what do you think of when you think of lukewarm water? I think that, that what many of us would think of when we think of lukewarm water, we would think of water that is at room temperature. And many of us, we, we actually enjoy to, to drink lukewarm or room temperature water, right? Because, you know, hey, if we drink water that is too cold for us, it, it may hurt our teeth. We don't want to drink water that is that is too cold. And, and we don't want to drink water that is going to burn our mouth. So we may let our water sit for uh, a few minutes. You know, we may let it sit there so it, it can reach room temperature so that we can drink it uh, a lot more easily than we could if it was cold or if it was too hot, right? That's what some of us would think, you know, we may equate lukewarm to being. And if you look up the definition of it, you know, lukewarm water, you may see it say something about room temperature water. But when I think of lukewarm water, I think of water that hasn't just set out for, you know, 20 to 30 minutes. I think about water that has set out for hours upon hours and maybe even days. And I don't know if you have ever done this before. But when water sits out for that long, if you go back to that cup and you pick that cup up and you try to drink that water, 
that water is going to have a smell to it, and it's not going to be a pleasant smell. And if you try to take a drink of that water, that, that water is going to have a taste as it smells, and it's not going to be good. I don't know if you've ever done that before. If you have, I imagine that you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you try to drink that water, you end up doing nothing but spitting it out of your mouth because of the, the bitter, sour taste that it has. And, and you'll pour it out and you'll end up just getting yourself some more water, some fresh water, we will say. Nobody likes that water. And so when I think of lukewarm, again, that's what I think of. And if, again, we take a look at what Jesus says about this church, he said that this church was lukewarm. It was neither cold nor hot. And he said there in the 16th verse that that because it wasn't cold or hot, he would vomit it out of his mouth, which would, would suggest that the aroma of that church wasn't pleasant. The taste of that church wasn't pleasant. It went bitter. It went sour. Uh, and, and it gave a bad taste to Jesus to where all he could do was, was spew it out of his mouth. He wanted nothing to do with trying to drink that church. So how does this happen? How does a church become lukewarm? Well, for us to, uh, to understand how this church became lukewarm, we, we need some more context here. So let's get some more context here by taking a look at what Jesus said there in the 17th verse. Where there in the 17th verse, Jesus has said, he said, because you say I am rich, have become wealthy and have need of nothing. I'm, I'm really stuck on the have need of nothing part that we see there in that verse. These people, they were wealthy. Jesus said they were rich and they live with a mindset that they had need of nothing. And, and what frightens me about this one is that there are so many people living in the world today that's on their grind and their hustle to reach this mindset to where they are so rich, they are so wealthy that they truly think and believe that they have need of nothing. And something that fascinates me about this statement is that a lot of the rich folks that, that I see on TV, at least, it always seems like they're always grinding and hustling. It seems to me, and this again is just perception, seems to me that very few of them uh, come to a place to where it seems like they're just happy with what they have. My perception again is that a lot of rich folks, they tend to want to add on to their riches. And I begin to wonder, well, will they ever be happy? Will they ever be content? Well, these rich folks here that was in Laodicea, they had it made. They didn't think that they needed to move. They didn't think that they needed to do anything else. They had their wealth and they were essentially done. That was it. No movement, no nothing. They sat still. That's why Jesus said, you're neither cold nor hot. You aren't doing anything. You're just there. Those who are of this church, and I've expressed this before about the church of the Laodiceans. I preached about this church earlier this year. Those who are of this church, they had become apathetic. They were uninterested. They didn't care. They were just, you know, there. I guess we would say they were there living life. But as you have heard me say in recent weeks, is that if the Holy Spirit truly does abide in you, if you truly are of sincere faith, you are not going to sit still in your faith. Faith is not supposed to be stagnant. The Holy Spirit is always in motion. It is always moving. You yourself, as a child of God, you have a calling. All of us have a commission. All of us have been given an assignment by Christ himself. Do you know what that assignment is? Well, the great commission that has been given to all of us who sincerely believe in we follow Christ is that we are to go into the world and to all people baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. That is, we are to be teaching all of those that are around us about Christ. 
sharing and ministering the good news. All that Jesus commanded us to observe, that is what we are to be sharing with all of those that are around us. Those who are of this church here, the church of Laodicea, they had their wealth, they had their possessions, and that was it. They were done. There was no movement. They sat still. They were lukewarm. Because they had their possessions, I would tell you that they put their trust in those possessions. They live by those possessions. And again, for me, this is very frightening because, again, so many are grinding and hustling for the dollar bill. And so many believe that the dollar bill is the end all be all to everything. You need happiness? Get a dollar. You want to, to be satisfied with life? Get a dollar. With a dollar, you can do absolutely anything. With millions and billions of dollars, you will have no worries. You don't even have to worry about your soul. You don't have to worry about the condition of your soul. You don't have to worry about the, the, the shape of your soul. You don't have to worry about whether your soul is in pieces or whether your soul is whole. Uh, if you have that dollar, hey, you have it made. That's what that's what many want you to think. That's what many want you to believe. And, and the truly frightening part is that there are many who profess they say that they are a child of God that live with this mindset of, hey, I need to get that dollar. There are many who profess, they again say that they are a child of God and they put their trust in the dollar bill rather than the Lord. So again, imagine that. Imagine saying that you are a child of God and rather than praying to the Lord, putting your hopes in God, leaning on, depending on God to, to move on your behalf, to lift you up, to bless you. You are putting your faith in that dollar in what you can do to gain that dollar in what you can buy, believing that you can buy your blessing, believing that you can buy satisfaction for your soul. I preached a couple of weeks ago. What is it that you hunger for in life? Are you eating from the food which perishes or are you eating from the food which endures into everlasting life? Those who are the church of the Laodiceans, hey, they were eating from the food which perishes and they were happy about it. Warning, warning, warning. This study is filled with a big warning sign here. It is a, a cautionary tale here to where again, the believer, the child of God, we cannot be stagnant in our faith. In the 14th chapter of Romans and the 19th verse, Paul, he encouraged believers not to become lukewarm in their faith. Let me turn over to the 14th chapter of Romans and the 19th verse. I want to read that scripture specifically to you so that you can see exactly what Paul encouraged there. And, and after that, I want to talk about something else that that becomes also present here. What we'll notice here with the church of the Laodiceans, but there in the 14th chapter of Romans and the 19th verse, you'll see where Paul said, therefore let us pursue the things which make for peace and the things by which one may edify another. Do you know what that means? Does it sound like Paul was saying that we should be sitting still? Nope. Doesn't sound like it. He said, pursue the things which makes for peace. That's again, our calling as a child of God. God is love. And in his love, he has loved us. He has given us his only begotten son who saved us from sins, who has redeemed us, who has sanctified us by his blood. He has tasked us to go out into the world and to minister and to share the good news, sharing the love that God has shared with all of us. We are to pursue peace in our calling. Paul, he said that 
that we should pursue the things which makes for peace and the things by which one may edify, that is for one to uplift, said that one may edify another. You as a child of God, you aren't supposed to tear anybody down. You as a child of God, you should always be motivating. You should always be encouraging, always sharing a good word in due time, in season and out of season. We are to be ready to exhort, Paul said. We are to be ready to teach. We are to be ready to encourage. We are to be ready to, to edify, to uplift. We are to be ready to move, not sit still. We cannot be lukewarm in our faith. Now, again, when we take a look there at that 15th and at that 16th verse, Jesus said that those who were of this church, that they were neither cold nor hot. He said there in, again, the 17th verse that they say, hey, I'm rich. He said that because they were wealthy, they said that they were in need of nothing. Now, look at this, what Jesus said there in the 17th verse as well, where he said that they did not know that they were wretched. They did not know that they were miserable, that they were poor, that they were blind and that they were naked. Now, what does that mean? What is what is Jesus talking about there? Because, again, they were rich, right? They had many possessions, right? So. Why would they be miserable? Why would they be wretched, right? What would make them, you know, be naked? Surely they could put some clothes on. Surely they, they, they had the money. They had that dollar bill, right? They could, they can go out and get the fancy clothes, right? So why does Jesus say there that they were wretched and that they were miserable? This reminds me of, of what Jesus said to the church in Smyrna. Again, let me turn over to the second chapter there. And again, I want to take a look at what Jesus said there to those who are in the, the persecuted church, the, the church that was in uh, Smyrna. There in the ninth verse of the second chapter, we'll see where Jesus, he said to the church in Smyrna, I know your works. He knew that they uh, underwent tribulation. And then there he said, that he knew their poverty. Those who are in the church of Smyrna, they didn't have much. Not compared to those who was in, in Laodicea. Laodicea, it was, it was a city that sat in, in a good position for trade. And, and so those who lived in that city, they had much wealth. But those who were in Smyrna, they lived in poverty. But Jesus, he said there in that ninth verse in the second chapter, but you are rich. So how could that be? What do we say, right? How was how was those who were in the church in Smyrna, how are they living in poverty, but they were rich? Well, they were rich, spiritually speaking. They were they were rich in the treasure of the Lord. So when we think again here about what Jesus said to those who are in the church of the Laodiceans, where he said, hey, y'all, y'all are rich. Indeed, y'all have wealth, but y'all say Y'all don't need anything. But I look at y'all. Jesus said that when he looks at them, he said that he saw those who were wretched, even though they didn't realize it. They were wretched. They were miserable. They were poor. They were blind and they were naked, not physically, but they were miserable. They were miserable. They were wretched. They were poor. They were blind. They were naked in their soul. What that means there is that they were absent of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit wasn't there. And again, these were the people that would go around and they would say, hey, I believe I'm a child of God. They would say, I'm a Christian. Tell me if you heard that one before. But look at their works. Look at their actions. There are many people today that will stand up. And they will proudly say, I'm a Christian. They'll tell the world that they are Christian, but look at their works. Their works, they, as Jesus said of those who are the church of Laodicea, they are neither cold nor hot. They are lukewarm. 
There's no fervor there. It's not even bitter. Jesus said, hey, I could wish that, that you, you had some bitterness, the bitterness of, of those who are of the church of Ephesus, because I can tell you, hey, remember your first love. Don't be bitter. I, I wish that, that you were fervent, like those who are of the church of Philadelphia. Remember, those who are of the church of Philadelphia, they, they were guided by the Holy Spirit. They were obedient to the Holy Spirit. And, and the Lord set doors before them, opportunities, blessings laid before them that they could attain, that they could walk through those doors and, and minister and do the works of the Lord. In the heavenly kingdom, it was open to them. But here, we see people that were carnal-minded. What do I mean by that? They were carnal-minded rather than spiritual-minded. Do you know what that means? What does it mean to be carnal? Well, to be carnal means that one has become worldly. They have a worldly mindset rather than a spiritual mindset. And that's what frightens me most today is that so many of us, rather than the spiritual, we are all for the world. We should be God first. What does that mean? Our thoughts, our actions, they ought to be led by the Holy Spirit. God should be on our mind. We should fear the Lord. We say that we are God fearing people, but but many of us, we aren't moving as if we are God fearing believers. You see, the God fearing believers know what the Lord will do to those who choose to indulge in sin. And because we know that God is going to punish sin, we do our very best not to get on God's bad side. We do our best to live in obedience to the word of God. We care about God's judgment. We live in fear of God's judgment. And so again, we live in obedience. My concern for today, my great worry of today, and yes, I worry about this, is that I look around and I see many who are my age and younger, many who are maybe slightly older than me, and then those who are, yes, older than me, there are many who are consumed with the food which perishes. They are consumed with the riches of this world, its splendor. They are consumed with the, the glories of the kingdom of this world rather than the kingdom of heaven. Jesus said, lay up your treasures in heaven where that, that treasure, it will not be destroyed. Don't lay up your treasures in the world for where you lay up your treasures, that's where your heart is. Again, the believers of this church, they will say, hey, I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. I believe in, in Jesus. But their treasures was right here in the world. Again, they had wealth. They had rich riches, but they were wretched. They were miserable. They were poor. They were blind. They were naked in their soul. I want to turn over to the third chapter of Colossians because in the third chapter of Colossians, Paul, he actually speaks of uh, the, the church of Laodicea. I turn over to the third chapter of Col uh, Colossians. When you get to the third chapter of Colossians, just take a look at the, the first two verses there. And then I'm going to also jump down to the 14th verse there as well. We'll see there in the first verse, if then you are raised with Christ, seek those things which are above where Christ is. Not in the world. Seek those things which are above. How many of us are doing that today? He said again, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. He said there in the second verse, he said, set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth. When you live for him, when your eyes are on heaven, as Luther Barnes sang, when heaven is on your mind, that's where again, 
That's where you're laying up your treasures. And that's where the Lord is going to take you one day. Now, we'll see there in the fifth verse. I'm going to take this fifth verse as well. I'm, I'm reading more scriptures than I intended there in the third chapter of Colossians. But I want to read this. He says, therefore, put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire and covetousness, which is idolatry. He said in the sixth verse, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. So what Paul was saying there is that we must not be carnal. We must we must put away that worldly mindset, put away the hunger for the riches of this world. What are the riches of this world going to do for you? The riches of this world, as I said in the sermon that I preached a few weeks ago, the riches of this world cannot buy you heaven. It can't buy you a ticket into heaven. It cannot buy you salvation. The riches of this world cannot deliver you from sin. In order to gain the riches of this world, many of us, we move in a manner that is totally opposite of the way of the Lord. Many of us, we move out of selfishness, out of lust. We move out of covetousness. We move out of greed. None of that speaks to the way of God. That speaks to a worldly mindset, which again, it says something about the, the Laodicean church because those who were of that church, they had wealth. They had the riches. Yes, some of them may have earned that through hard work. But again, I'm very concerned. I'm very concerned about our world today. Now we see there in the 14th verse where Paul, he said to the Colossians there in the 14th verse, it says, but above all these things, put on love which is the bun of perfection. He was encouraging them to turn away from the worldly mindset and to put on love. That is to, to move in the faith of God. The faith of God is again, to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. Those who were of uh, the church in Laodicea, they, they are mentioned there in the fourth chapter of Colossians where we'll see there in the fourth chapter of Colossians in the 16th verse where, where Paul was closing out his epistle, his letter to the Colossians, where Paul said in the 16th verse, he says, now when this epistle is read among you, he said, see that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans and that you likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. Very interesting note there in the 16th verse. He said again, I just want to, I really want to highlight this. He said, read this epistle among you. See that it is read also in the church of the Laodiceans. Paul, he knew what was going on in the church of Laodicea. Those who were in that church, they, they were moving with that carnal mindset. If you, if you look at the letter to the, the Colossians, You'll see where where Paul was speaking of the carnal mind and, and how one needed to turn away from the carnal mind. And again, the the carnal mind is a mind that is world uh, that is worldly. It is focused on the world. And and those who are of Laodicea, they were focused a great deal on the world. And, and so Paul having that warning there and then seeing Jesus talk about this church here. We'll see that those who are of this church, that they were giving over to the worldly mindset. And so for Jesus to say there in that 17th verse that those who are of this church were wretched, it says a great deal about them in comparison to the other six churches that we have studied about. Yes, that includes the, the dead church, the church in Sardis. Yes, that includes the church in Thyatira, the corrupt church. Yes, that includes the, the compromising church that was in Pergamos. This church was worse than those churches because at least those churches had something good that that Jesus could praise. Jesus had nothing that he could praise about this church. They didn't have any works. They were lukewarm. They didn't move out of love. They were lukewarm. They didn't care. They were apathetic. They weren't interested in laboring for the Lord. Those who are of this church. They didn't have a prayer life. They didn't need anything. And I'm telling you today, everybody needs God. 
everybody stands in the need of prayer. I love to hear my mom pray and I love to, to hear her, her pray for all of those who stand in the need of prayer. Every single person, I don't care what your bank account says. Every single person is in the need of help from the Lord. Every single person needs God's assistance in life. All of us, we go through things. We are all afflicted, whether that our afflictions are physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. All of us, we have tribulation that we cannot overcome on our own. All of us, we face an adversary, a great adversary who desires nothing but to tear and bring us down. We don't wrestle against flesh and blood. No, we wrestle against principalities and powers and, and rulers of, of darkness, spiritual hosts of wickedness that, that even dwell in the heavenly places. Church of Laodicea, hello. Church of today, local churches today, believers today. I am concerned because again, we live in a period of time where even churches are preaching uh, a message of prosperity, not spiritual prosperity, but the dollar bill. You won't ever hear me preach that message. I'm all about the spirit. I focus in on the spirit. I despise the, the, the food which perishes. I despise it. I, I'm all about the food which endures unto everlasting life. And, and in this message, from Jesus here, that is what he was encouraging the, the angel of the church to preach. It was time for this angel of the church to stand up and deliver this word to all of those who are the church of Laodicea. Because again, there we will see that, that Jesus, he had a, a very grave warning that, that he mentioned there in the 16th verse. I'm going to jump right back to the 16th verse. I, this is my key verse, the 15th and the 16th verse. I focused a lot on the 17th verse, but the 16th verse there is a warning here. We'll see Jesus say there in the 16th verse, because you are lukewarm, because they weren't, they didn't have any works. They, they weren't moving out of the love of God. They, they, I don't believe had a fellowship. I don't even think they had a true relationship with the Lord. Jesus said, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. Jesus, he said there that he would vomit them out of his mouth. He said, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, the fact that he said that he will vomit them out of his mouth, that is very scary. It's very scary to me. And the reason why it is so scary is because there are many people living in the world today who profess to be a child of God, who are of the church of the Laodiceans. And there are many who are of that church today that aren't rich. They don't have great wealth, but they don't think that they need the Lord. There are many believers today who say that, or I should say there are many so-called believers today who say that they are Christians who are of the Laodicean church. They say that they are a Christian, but their actions, because they aren't moving in faith, their actions say otherwise. And, and it's, it's scary to me that, that some of us, we, Jesus won't even be able to, to consume us. He, he, he doesn't want to abide with us. He, doesn't want to, to gather us up. He said that he would vomit those who are the church of Laodicea, those who are carnal. I want to be very clear about this. Those who have that carnal mind, those who, again, think about this. Those who are of this church, they trusted in the, the worldly riches that they had over the Lord. Do you think for a second that that God would want to, to gather someone who is trusting in some riches of this world over him. Do you really think that the Lord will, will, will gather that person, will bring that person with him into his heavenly kingdom when they don't trust in him, where they're trusting in something of the world, some kind of treasure of this world over him? Just 
it, it doesn't sound like it, it will work. If we turn over to the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel, and this one is, is going to truly, 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 is going to ring very loud for us here. When we turn over to the seventh chapter of, of Matthew's gospel, I want us to go down to the, the 21st verse there. That's again, the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel. When we get there, let's take it down to the 21st verse. And there we'll see in the 21st verse where Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my father in heaven. If you do the will of the father, if you are actually moving sincerely by faith, you will be there. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. There are many today that are saying that they are Christians that won't enter into the kingdom of heaven because they weren't moving by sincere faith. Let's take that 22nd verse as well. There in the 22nd verse, and again, I'm in the seventh chapter of Matthew's gospel. Jesus said, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name? Have we not cast out demons in your name? Have we not done many wonders in your name? They will ask. And in the 23rd verse, Jesus, he said, then I would declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. I tell you, well, that one, like I said, that one, for me, that one hits. And again, it to me says, it speaks loudly of the church of the Laodiceans. It speaks loudly of uh, the world today in which we live, where Paul in his second letter to Timothy, he described that there would be a time in the third chapter of second Timothy. And I, again, like I said, I preached this recently. He described a time that would be perilous. And, and in those days, Paul said that in perilous times, those perilous days, that people would be lovers of themselves and money. He said that they would be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of the Lord. And lovers of themselves, lovers of money, he said they would be lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of the Lord. In the fourth chapter of Second Timothy, Paul, he said to Timothy, he wrote to Timothy that the day would come where, again, people, they would turn away from the word of God. You see a lot of that today. Like I said, there's a lot of ministering going on today within churches that has nothing to do with the sound doctrine of God. And again, like I said, that's it's very sad because it speaks of the church of the Laodiceans to where we are again, straying away from the word of God for the world. And that's not what we as believers ought to be doing. You see, when we move in this manner, Jesus said, we are moving in a manner where there's no, no fire for the Lord. We aren't even bitter. Jesus said that he wished that we could, would be cold or hot. He wished that we would have works that were cold or hot because he could, again, encourage us if our works were hot to keep on being hot for the Lord, be fervent for the Lord. And if our works were cold, he can really get on us to, to wake up and, and get back to the sound doctrine. But when people don't care, when the church stops caring, we are in a world of trouble. And so Jesus's message to the church of the Laodiceans was one to wake up. And that's a message that, again, is for all of us today as believers, whether you're awake or not. Jesus, he wants you to remain awake. If you are fervent for the Lord, good on you. Jesus would encourage you to remain fervent. 
If you are asleep, if you are cold in your faith, Jesus will say, Hey, why are you asleep? Wake up. If you are apathetic in your faith, like the church of the Laodiceans, we'll see there in the 18th verse where Jesus says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. Put those possessions, those earthly treasures aside and turn to the Lord and God will make you rich in your soul. And Jesus, he said there again in 18 verse, he said that you should buy from him gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed. And Jesus said, anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. And there in the 19th verse, Jesus, he said, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore be zealous as be fervent, be, be filled with fire and repent. So had Jesus vomited this church out yet? No, he hadn't. But he said he would if they if they continue to be apathetic, uncaring, not caring about being in fellowship with the Lord. If they continue to, to have that carnal mindset, Jesus, he would vomit them out. And so some of us would think that this gets to the topic of, of believers losing salvation. Well, I want you to understand that when you are trusting in the riches of this world over the Lord, you aren't, you are not faith. You can say that you believe in God all you want, but if you aren't trusting in the Lord, if you aren't leaning on the Lord, if you don't depend on the Lord, if you aren't living in obedience to his instructions, you aren't, you aren't of faith. There's no salvation to lose. You never had it. Those who are this church, they didn't have salvation. Jesus, he, 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 he couldn't abide with them. He would vomit them out of their mouth if they continued down the path that they were going down. The Lord does not abide with sin. If you are of a worldly mindset, God will not abide with you. He wants you to turn away from sin. He wants you to turn away from the world to move in repentance. That is heed his rebuke. The Lord has given those who are of this church. He has given them a rebuke. And now the onus is on them to heed his rebuke. He has told them you're not doing right by putting your trust in the riches that you have. Now, if you want to, if you're saying that you believe that you are a Christian. Now, if you want to be sincere about that, turn away from those riches, turn to me. That's the same thing that he told the rich young ruler as well. That's what Jesus told the rich young you ruler. And so that's something, again, this message is sit with all of us today because so many of us, we are hung up on the world where this world, it is passing away. Do you want to pass away with this world or do you want to live on eternally? I want to live on eternally. And so Jesus says here again, be zealous and repent. Wake up. Wake up and move in that repentance. Jesus was showing those who are of this church. He was showing them mercy, the same mercy that he shows all of us today. He gives all of us a second chance. He gives us a, another opportunity. Each and every day that we live is another chance. It is another opportunity for us to grow for us to improve in our being, for us to turn to the Lord and, and to lean on him, depend on him and trust in him. Isn't that what the proverb says? That we should not lean on our own understanding, but that we should lean on the understanding of the Lord. Why aren't we doing that? We'll see there that Jesus said in the 20th verse, he said, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and dine with him and he with me. Jesus, he desired to be in fellowship with those who are of this church. He not only desires to be in fellowship with those who are of this church, but Jesus, he desires to be in fellowship with all of us. That's not just us as believers. That's those who are sinners today as well. 
He desires to enter in and sit down at the table with you and dine with you. He wants to be in fellowship with you. Do you want to be in fellowship with him? Or, hey, do you want to be in fellowship with those riches that you are grinding and hustling for today? And so there in the 21st verse, we'll see that Jesus said to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. And then the 22nd verse, Jesus said, he who has an ear, let him hear what the spirit says to the churches. So that closes out our, our studies on the seven churches that Jesus had a message for there in the second and in the third chapter of the book of Revelation. And again, it is a message that should resonate with all of us today. The harsh truth that has been revealed to all of us, especially in, in our study here this week, is that we must turn away from the worldly mindset. We have to put the world behind us. And we have to move in repentance. That is, we have to, to heed the Lord's instructions for us to, to improve so that we can overcome sin and so that we can, can dwell with him. We must not compromise in our faith. We must not corrupt our soul. We must move in sincere faith, not by religion. We must move out of love, with fire and compassion, and not out of bitterness. We have to turn away from the route in which we are going in today. The route that we seemingly are going in today has become a route where either we aren't sharing the sound doctrine of the Lord because, hey, we may be afraid, we may be persecuted, we may be going through some things as, again, we saw was present, you know, with all of those churches that we have studied about. Some of us, again, we may be apathetic, may not care to move anymore because the world has beat us down. And again, some of us, we may have become bitter. The harsh truth is that we should not continue in this way. The Lord has his rebuke. And in the seven churches, we have seen that rebuke. What are we going to do in response? I hope our response is to move in repentance. Okay. All right. So that is our study for this week. I certainly thank all of you for, for joining me in these studies. And I hope that you will share these studies with someone somewhere and in our next study, we're going to skip our study next week. We'll be back on the last Wednesday of the month where we'll have another study. We're going to continue on in our seasons of studies. Let me give you a hint what we'll be studying about next. We're going to be studying about church. Is it okay for us to skip out on church or should we go to church? That's what we're going to be taking a look at in our next study. I hope to see you there already make sure that you're following here on youtube so that you don't miss a bible study so that you don't miss a sermon sunday school lesson or a food for thought take a moment follow today